thank you for uh, making it this morning, uh, for braving those lines. And I also know Mary making went on uh, into the wee hours. So thank you for waking up and being here. Uh, so, so my name is Panthea, and I am with Reboot. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, participatory budgeting this morning and what Reboot's been working on in the, this is okay, we can do this, yeah. And what Reboot's been working on in the last year or so um, around uh, the, the, uh, the global participatory budgeting movement. Um, and also what civic tech can and can't do uh, for this global movement. I think that while we're gonna be focusing on participatory budgeting, um, PB, um, I think that the applications and the lessons will actually be interesting to um, folks working on other civic tech issues and on uh, participatory democracy more broadly. So who here is familiar with PB history, where it's come from? Okay, I think most, most of the crowd. Um, maybe just a really quick history lesson, uh, 30 years ago, in 85, uh, Brazil ended about 20 years of mil military dictatorship. 88, there was a new constitution. And in 89, the Workers' Party, um, uh, along with a couple of pro-democracy social movements, introduced participatory budgeting in, in, a, in a Porto Alegre in the south of Brazil. Um, and this was really significant. Um, at the time, there were about a third of the population living in informal, settle, in, informal settlements or favelas. Um, without really access to city services, um, public health services, infrastructure, or whatnot. And it was really seen um, as a movement for um, redistributive uh, social justice, as a way to at reallocate resources to the poor, the marginalized. Um, and the way that participatory budgeting works, it really does look different kind of everywhere you go, um, but loosely the elements are the same. Citizens are able to input on the development of a city budget, um, uh, for the most part, um, they're able to participate in how that budget is allocated, um, what, what needs and what challenges should be prioritized. They work with government to design these projects, to allocate the money, and then in the case of Porto Alegre and many places around the world, they actually monitor the implementation of these to, to, to basically make sure that the projects are implemented according to plan. And in the last 30 years, we've really seen a huge um, surge in participatory budgeting implementations globally. Um, and it's been called by some as a hope for democracy or the hope for democracy. This is Nelson Diaz's term. Uh, some of you may be familiar with his work. Um, and it's not hard to understand why. You know, we live in an era where there is, uh, where liberal democracy is uh, failing, where people have growing mistrust of um, government, of their political institutions, um, of the political class, and people don't really know how to engage with government, how to change this. We know that we should show up to vote every four years, six years, whatever your cycle is, um, but other than that, we, but, but the thing is, we feel that our elected representatives uh, don't represent us, don't represent our interests, and yet we don't really know what to do about them. And so PB tries to change that. PB tries to bring people into the process of government so that they can input on solving the challenges that are most important to them. Um, whoops. And if we take a look at the rise of PB, um, now in the last 30 or so years, there's been uh, 7,000 implementations globally. Um, and really, really across the world. It's spread faster than liberal democratic regimes themselves. Um, and it, it sort of poses a contradiction to what we sometimes see as a stalemate in, uh, in the sort of uh, growth of democracy and uh, democratization efforts um, and sort of this, uh, and uh, sort of countering this, this global trend in this, um, in this sort of deadlock that we have. And, and, and we see PB growing in mature democracies in new democracies, in democracies that are struggling, in autocratic regimes. Um, and I think something that, it, that so, something that is really interesting about PB is that it's really supporting uh, local bottom-up um, uh, civic participation and supporting democratization at a rate and in a way that national level uh, movements um, cannot. And so what does civic tech have to do with all of this? We're at Tic Tech. Um, well, civic tech promises to make participatory budgeting easy. Uh, the idea is if that if once a government decides to adopt this, um, whether you know by mandate or through uh, pressure from ad uh, from advocacy groups, 
The idea is that, you know, different uh, technology products uh, offer a turnkey solution. You know, we have secure voting here. It's GDPR compliant. Um, we have different platforms. Um, Desi Deem is going to be talking a little bit later. And there's a couple of different platforms out there that aren't purely focused on, on PV, but PV is one of the key applications. And this is really helping power the uptake and spread globally, as we're seeing. Uh, Consul, which is one of the ones that my team looked at closely uh, because we are working in Madrid, um, itself has uh, been implemented in over 30 countries. Um, there's about 100 active contributors on GitHub. It's an open source platform. And uh, by its own accounting, about 90 million citizens have participated in some way on the platform. So that's great. The, the, those are the numbers. But what have we gotten 7,000 implementations later? The thing is, it's kind of hard to say. Um, because right now, PB is suffering a little bit from uh, what we call sort of everything to everybody syndrome. So in one of the implementations we looked at, uh, these were all the reasons when we talked to officials that were involved as to why they were implementing PB. It's going to empower the marginalized. It's going <clears> to <throat> empower civil society. It's going to improve government accountability. It's going to improve gov government legitimacy so that we can then generate tax revenue and then attract donor support. Um, it is going to make sure that we allocate um, natural resource revenue responsibly. It's trying to be everything to everybody, and what sometimes happens then is you kind of do nothing great at all, um, which is in the case of some of the implementations that we saw. Um, so backing up for a moment, um, what's Reboot's role in all of this? Um, so uh, for those that are not familiar with us, we were founded nine years ago um, with the idea that ordinary people, especially those most marginalized, should have a meaningful say in the policies and programs that impact their lives. And we work in uh, many different ways to do that. Um, we were brought in to this process, um, actually following on the good work of my society um, and of uh, Brian Wampler, Mike Touchton, Stephanie McNulty, who had been working with the Hewlett Foundation for a while to understand why is participatory budgeting not living up to its potential? We've had uh, significant investments. There's been sort of this global um, upsurge. And yet, it looks kind of different everywhere. And the results have been pretty uneven. So we sort of went, underwent this um, co-design process that I'm actually not really going to go into. Um, but what's important for right now is uh, we looked deeply at four different contexts, because some of the work of my society and others noted that we actually needed to go beyond case studies and look at cross-country comparisons. And there was the idea that we needed to actually set up a global participatory budgeting body to actually uh, create and enforce standards, um, oversee uh, the quality of implementations with the idea that that could help the movement have greater impact. Um, but Hewlett didn't want to get into what they call knee-jerk partnership creation, so we went through this process. Um, and so we took a look at four implementations closely. Um, we looked at um, a big national level effort in Madagascar, one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, we went to Madrid, um, one of the global um, civic tech innovators um, in participatory democracy, where there's about a million, uh, uh, 100 million euros um, being um, allocated each year and about 10% of the city participating. Uh, Mexico City. Um, where there's about 3% participating and 95% of the um, decided projects are actually implemented, which is interesting and we'll come back to later. And then finally, we went to um, Seoul, which is one of the world's largest implementations um, where a third of the municipal budget is allocated through PV. So we looked at a range um, of implementations as well as socio-political context um, for this work. Uh, this is the co-design workshop we did at the end of last year. Um, so what did we find? Is the hope for democracy um, billing correct? Depends on what you think the problems of democracy are. So what we found is that participatory budgeting is really great um, at giving folks a first-rate civic education. And this is important. Because people for a long time in many countries have been told that politics and governance is something they don't understand, that they can't participate in. Um, um, I live in uh, the US right now, where it um, feels like for a long time people have been told, you know, pay attention to Brad and Angelina, pay attention to the Kardashians, pay attention to reality TV, show up and vote every four years, do your civic duty. And other than that, you know, policymaking is something that happens in DC or in Brussels, or in London, or wherever, so don't worry about it. Uh, 
and what that hap and, and then what, what what happens as a result of that is people don't really understand um, how government works. And so when people talk about government not working for them, usually they're actually talking just at the tip of the iceberg up here. What they're talking about is the, 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 the programs that are offered to me, the services that are offered to me, they don't actually meet my needs. What they don't actually see, or we don't often talk about, is all these other steps, all the other, uh, all the other steps in the process for actually uh, determining whether or not the right policies, programs, services are implemented. And so what PB does is it brings people into this process on how to identify different needs and challenges, how to prioritize and negotiate between them, how to allocate funding, how to design projects, um, and takes people through all of this. And the PB process itself is really fantastic at this. Um, and beyond the natural civic education that citizens get through participating in this process, we're also seeing some implementations doing some really interesting work at further supporting um, citizens' civic education. So in Seoul, for example, um, this is really fascinating. So they, uh, they um, have set up this thing called Budget School, which is basically any citizen that wants to sit on their citizen, um, on their resident delegate committees, has to attend this school to understand what PB is and how to design and allocate money um, in a way that is in line with government protocol. And so every year they have about 2,000 citizens that go through this program, and then they randomly select about 250 of them to actually become these citizen delegates um, to prevent uh, capture for personal or, or, or political interests. And it's seen as a very competitive and prestigious thing. Um, us Asians, we like extra credit um, homework. Um, and then beyond that, there's also uh, Seoul actually invests in hiring citizen uh, and hiring consultants. So any citizen that develops a proposal that wants basically extra support on how to translate that into something uh, for government, the government will actually pay for consultants to help them do so. Um, I thought this was really, really fascinating. And so the more people understand how to engage with government, the better democracy works. And I think this is really the potential of participatory budgeting. It helps them with the civic education and helps them with how to translate their ideas into practice. So then back to civic tech. What is the role of technology in all of this? So with the caveat that my colleagues that are going to speak after uh, work on these platforms deeply, we were. Um, we were looking, tech was actually not a focus of our work, but we did um, have some interesting observations on where it can or can't help. And so let's start with a theory. The theory is that technology lowers the barriers to participation. So by enabling more people to be able to participate, we think that citizens will then engage in civic, and more citizens will engage in civic and democratic processes. With more people inputting and putting pressure on governments and telling government what they want, the idea is then that government is more responsive and more accountable to citizen needs. Then democracy thrives. Sunshine, rainbows, we're all happy. Does this actually happen? So what we observed doesn't quite match with the theory. Um, and I'd be curious for um, other experiences um, that, that, uh, that, that, that my colleagues will share. Um, this first point should not be surprising to, to, to anyone here. Technology amplifies the needs of those that know how to use technology. We know this. Um, so with PB, um, we've seen different processes that favor um, the privileged, resource actors, people with the time, the capacity, the energy, who know how to use the process um, for, uh, to achieve their ends. And so one of the observations with Mexico City and why there's been 95% implementation of winning projects, um, far higher than in many other places, is basically it's another form of clientelism and the folks that are submitting projects are basically um, folks that are embedded in the political structures already. Um, and there's been, um, they found uh, government officials that have basically um, done voting fraud and taken uh, citizens' identities to be able to vote for them um, through the PB process. Um, I live in New York City, and um, if you were to look at New York City this week on to, as to what the top um, PB proposals are, um, these are them. So um, we have someone who is very, um, who's, a, who's a very passionate conservationist and very excited about monarch butterflies. 
um, which I am not one to comment on whether or not monarch butterflies are important. I'm sure they're beautiful and wonderful and important, but um, should this be the top um, PB priority for New York City? I don't know, who's to say? Um, districts in New York that sign up for this um, get to, uh, have to commit to allocating one, one million dollars of, uh, of their budget, shoot, okay, I have to go, um, of, their, of their budget um, to PB. So then, the, so then uh, the, the second part of our theory of change is that more citizens engage in civic and democratic processes. Is that true? Well, we see more citizens exercising their civic voice, certainly, um, but the signal to noise ratio can be overwhelming to the point where people actually disengage and people don't want to participate anymore. Um, this, is a, this is a comment that we heard from one of the uh, uh, residents in Madrid who basically looked at, um, who looked at consul, and I think the year that we were looking at it, I think there were 200,000 proposals that were submitted, and they said, I'm done. I can't deal with this, there's too much, there's too much noise on here, so I actually don't know what to, what to put my vote behind, I don't have time to sift through all this, this feels overwhelming, I'm out. Third link in our chain, um, government is more, account uh, is more responsive and accountable. The challenge is with these processes, um, a lot of the times the proposals are getting, that are getting submitted are actually not implementable by government. So um, it is uh, not within that government's jurisdiction. It does not meet civic codes. It does not meet, um, it, is, uh, it is motivated by, um, we've seen some sort of racist, xenophobic um, proposals up there. Um, and, and so I think a big part that's missing is sort of thinking about how to integrate these proposals and how to help government actually understand these proposals, how to um, integrate them into the way that government's um, doing things. And I know this is something that my colleagues will be speaking about in a bit. And so the theory that PB and some of the other work that we do is gonna help democracy thrive. What we're actually seeing is that there's, PB can also support democratic disillusionment by both citizens and governments. They've participated, their proposals don't move forward, government gets overwhelmed, they feel like citizens are actually not helping and not giving them anything that's useful. Um, and so, yeah. And so if we think about what to do about this, let's go back to Porto Alegre. What worked about this process? What worked was that citizens and governments were sitting down talking about how to solve problems together. It was messy, it was difficult, but over the course of this process, they sat down face to face with each other and worked through it. And so while PB can inspire democratic renewal, I think one of the things that my team found was that civic tech plus PB can actually, runs the risk of accelerating democratic disillusionment. And so what, and so what to do? Um, I have three quick ideas that I'm gonna run through. Uh, the first thing is to help people, help citizens find others that share their interests and frustration and nurture their engagement. The key, the key word here being nurture. Civic engagement is not something that happens magically, as we all know, but we, 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 we know we have to foster and support it, but we actually don't often know how to go about that. So something that's really fascinating that I thought um, in Madrid um, and that Pablo, I think, worked on is uh, basically with those 200,000 proposals, they started doing data analysis on it to understand what were the patterns and the themes and what were the things that came out and how, ca how can we help people match make. So four of the themes that came up that were common um, or common enough to have a critical mass were um, uh, children, the elderly, environment, and sport. And so they ran these workshop at Participa Lab, um, which is an independent semi-government group. Um, and uh, ran these, uh, and, and basically invited all the people that had submitted proposals under these four themes together to meet each other. And to say, hey, could you develop better proposals than you would on your own if you came and met and talked about it? What do you care about? What do you care about? What do you think should happen? Um, this is, these are photos from the uh, children workshop where you see people brought their kids. There was co-design work and the city invested in bringing designers and writers and technical specialists to help them develop their proposals and then to help them organize. And so the proposals that came out of this, uh, this is the Right to Play campaign, one of the most popular that I think has been since spun off into its own sort of movement NGO. Um, they developed these proposals that were, um, that were rigorous, that were well considered, that were things that government could actually put forward. Um, and they had an active and engaged community around it. And I think what's su super fascinating about this is in Madrid, they, I mean, yes, they're known for consul, but they're also thinking about how to use the, how, how to use consul and how to use PB as a sensing mechanism. As a sensing mechanism for when someone puts something 
in a, in a PV process, yes, it gets lost, yes, it doesn't move forward, but someone's put up their hand to say, I want to change things in my community, and they're then helping them do so. It may not happen through PV, but they are funneling their interest and engagement into something else, and I think that's really fascinating and something that we should all learn from. So, yes, we know this is not true, but this is what they did in Madrid. Think of your platform broadly, find unexpected applications, okay, go, 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 great. Nurture. Um, can I take two more minutes? Are you prepared to second to wrap up? I'll wrap up quickly. Thanks. Okay. Uh, second thing, we have to help governments make sense of citizen sentiment. How do we look at the data exhaust um, that's coming out of these platforms? Um, and so in Seoul, basically, they're looking at uh, the, the proposals that are submitted and even the ones that don't move forward, they're basically using it as proxy indicators to understand uh, what public services uh, citizens are dissatisfied with and then funneling that data into the relevant ministries, departments, agencies um, uh, to take care of. Um, Reboot's doing our own sort of work and experiments with our own data exhaust, um, and I think this is interesting for international organizations to think about. When we do international research that feeds up into international organizations, movements, whatnot, how do we actually feed back into the communities that we're extracting this data from? We develop some media fellowships, happy to talk about that later. Um, and then the third is, of course, we need to build for citizens and government both, because democracy requires both of them. And so, folks over here, we like to design for citizens. This is the sexy front end citizen engagement side of civic engagement. It's this, we love people power. Um, this is what um, our funders will support. This is what we all think about, um, absolutely. But we need to integrate with how government works. I have stories on all these folks. You can find me later. Um, and so I think we need to design for the unsexy back end government integration side of things. Um, I don't think a SPEGI is going to um, take off, but I would love a better acronym um, because I think we need to work here. Um, and so civic tech 1.0, how do you aggregate and rise up voice? 2.0, how do we actually develop proposals um, using aggregated voice? And I think 3.0 is gonna be the messy stuff of how we integrate with government. Um, I think this is the sweet spot. Um, I think this is where responsible civic tech kitty lives. She's lonely, she wants friends, please work with her. Um, because I think otherwise, um, it's actually irresponsible the stuff that we're doing, seriously. I think we are then sort of uh, driving up expectations. We are driving engagement. We want people to participate. And frankly, when that participation is not met by delivery, by results, people can disengage further. And I think as a community, that, that's, that's irresponsible of us to do. And I think we should think carefully about those consequences. Um, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jules Bardot talking about participatory budgeting in France. Good morning, everyone. I'm just expecting my slides um, to appear. So I will talk to, uh, this morning about the different cases uh, of participatory budgeting that we have in France. Um, just to let you know, we started, uh, well, a little bit like five years ago, we had like maybe four cases uh, of participatory budgeting. And uh, this weekend I was um, updating my list and we got more than 150 cases now. Uh, so it's all started, the big story started with uh, Paris. Can we scale up the, the slides? Uh, yeah, un bouton. Um, Oh, for screen, yeah. in, in, well, wait, it's, it does, it's, I will, I will, um, I will carry on. So uh, basically, I wanted to to show you uh, how this uh, device uh, traveled in, um, in in France, uh, and try to tell you that uh, maybe Paris is not uh, a model for other cities, and I will explain why. Um, it's, uh, so as I said, it started like in, in, in Paris, uh, the, the big um, trend uh, arrived with Paris and they, uh, they are French, so they are very proud. Uh, this uh, tweet says like they have the biggest uh, participatory budgeting in the world, so take the, the, the keys of the money. I think it's uh, dans Google, en fait, bon, c'est pas, bon, pas grave. Um, so, what we have is like a proce processes that are very different from um, from Porto Alegre. So I also have like uh, some pictures from the last uh, from the last year about what happened 
so they are still organizing meetings where they could discuss proposals uh, about uh, specific neighborhoods and also uh, based on um, uh, the different uh, topics. Uh, so it could be about education or it could be about public transports. Uh, as you could see in, the, in this um, uh, ballot paper, you got, uh, the, they not only select uh, the, the representatives that they have, but also they will vote on the different priorities uh, so this one is on specific uh, topic about culture and, and youth, and they will decide uh, um, so the different policies within uh, culture and youth, the different uh, priorities. So it's not only about voting on specific projects, they vote on policies, which is pretty different from uh, what we see in, in, in different countries, and, and France is not uh, an exception. Uh, so my work uh, during my PhD is about two uh, different stuff. Uh, I, I'm trying to compare France and Brazil about how this device is traveling, so what we call uh, in our language policy transfers, and we are trying to understand the different drivers and also the outcomes, because what we uh, could build with participatory budgeting in uh, Brazil is pretty different from what we uh, have seen here in Europe. So um, to say in a, in a short way, uh, in Porto Alegre, you could build uh, schools and uh, uh, health centers and um, uh, kindergarten. Well, in, in, in France, it's a little bit like the proposals that you just saw about uh, New York. It's more, more about green spaces, uh, community gardens, and uh, bike lanes. So yeah, uh, that's, uh, that we are not making the same city in the different part of the world with PB, so it's uh, different to to, to compare. Uh, so one part of my work is trying to understand uh, how to model the different uh, variations of PB, just to let you know that basically, if we take the example about Brazil, there is a difference, between, a distinction between uh, what we could call like a powerful PB and something that is more like a PB light, light uh, version of PB without all the, the different features. Um, so in France, we have like uh, different steps. I'm sure that you're already uh, aware of that because you got the uh, perfect presentation from Paris yesterday. Uh, basically, they are defining the rules. Uh, well, each city is defining the rules and they could collect the proposals uh, from individual citizens or from NGOs. And then there is a, a phase that is a very uh, critical where they are reviewing the cost and the feasibility for each proposal. So that's part, this part where in Paris they got for the first year, uh, I think it was more than uh, 3,000 uh, proposals. So it was difficult to, to filter that. And then they're organizing votes. And the last part, which is uh, essential, implementing proposals, which also goes with some difficulties. So basically most of the, well, many uh, cities have uh, try to implement PB uh, and using a platform. Uh, so for example, in this case, it's like Angien, uh, and I'm sure that Virgil will look at there is a, one specific part of the picture, which is actually a copy and paste from the, their uh, DCDM uh, platform. Um, you see that uh, basically uh, they are trying to collect the IDs and that's uh, the first part. Uh, then they, there is the vote and they are using many of those platforms to organize the vote. So we got different uh, uh, waves. Nothing started exactly with Paris. Uh, after the first uh, World Social Forum organized in Brazil, there were many processes that were started, uh, well, many, uh, 10 cities, which is not a lot when you know that in France we have more than uh, uh, 35,000 uh, cities. Uh, so only 10 cities that were very close to the French Communist Party. And then uh, starting in, uh, in 2005, there was a new wave uh, that was addressing the needs of uh, uh, high schools. Uh, so basically, uh, students were able to vote to decide what kind of works uh, would be uh, done in high schools in a specific uh, region that was led by uh, the former uh, uh, minister Ségolène Royal. And then in 2014, uh, since so it was uh, the date of the last local elections, we got Paris that started the process and other cities, and uh, now it's like more than four millions of people that are able to uh, take part in participatory budgeting. Oops, no, that's a mistake. Pop, pop, pop. Mm -mm -mm. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, okay. Just uh, remember that 
Yeah, just remember that uh, most of the cities that are implementing PB are actually uh, very uh, in small uh, towns. So it's like, this is going crazy. Okay. Yes. Uh, so we got, uh, so just the slides that you saw, you, you saw the map of participatory budgeting across the world uh, that was taken from the, the book from uh, Nelson Diaz in your, in your presentation. And last year we only had like 80 uh, processes and now we are, uh, so we are like uh, 70 more processes. So it's really hard to follow that. So what is important here is like, if you compare to the number of cities that we got and the number of uh, participatory budgeting, it's mainly targeting uh, cities that are above a specific threshold. So if you're a city that has more than 100,000 uh, uh, residents, then you are more likely to implement uh, PB. Even if most of the processes are in small towns, but since they have very few uh, inhabitants, they just uh, don't represent m much people. Um, so yeah, it's uh, complicated to follow because it's a very uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of cities and a lot of interviews to, to be to be done. Um, what was um, what was happening last year? Uh, not last year, the last decade for the first wave is like the processes were mainly uh, consultative. So basically, people um, would go to the meetings. They would say what they wanted, and then at some point, the city hall would decide without any vote what would be the conclusion? So it's a bit like the Grand Debat that you have uh, uh, heard of. Uh, basically, you go to a meeting, you talk, and then the elected people decide what they really want to do with that. There is no, not anything in the process that could say, well, the, top, uh, the number one priority is this. Um, and so there is this uh, first uh, limit. The last one is the fact that um, there was not any uh, procedural uh, procedural clarity about what is uh, the way that process uh, the process was done. So in many cities, basically, they could change the, the rules uh, during the process because of anything. So that was not very clear. And what is the, the was, uh, what was striking as, as well it was the fact that the mayor or actually the city officials were able to decide and they were really at the center of, uh, of the process. They could decide about everything well in Brazil most of the processes were, and the rules were decided by the civil society, which is very different from the, the, the French former cases and from the, the current ones as well, where uh, all the, start, the processes are started by the CC officials. There is not an official demand from civil society organizations. So they are not uh, uh, designing the rules, and that has some uh, impact on that. Um, and now it works. One thing that is very uh, important from the last research that has been uh, that have been done in um, in uh, political science is the fact that in some cases participatory budgeting is much more powerful than other participatory processes. Um, so uh, they some uh, researchers, uh, just like Joan Font and, and Grant Smith, have uh, tried to follow to track the, the different proposals uh, from different participatory processes in uh, in Spain. And they've shown that actually uh, the, the proposals made through PB were more likely to be implemented, to be uh, really uh, to see the, 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 the reality uh, at some point. And for two reasons, mainly uh, because there is a dedicated uh, budget, which is very different from other uh, processes. And then they claim that also because they have, uh, there is a part of uh, citizen monitoring. So people will push and to put pressure on the city, on the local government in order to implement this, the, the, the decisions that were decided through participatory budgeting, which is not exactly the, the same thing in other processes. So what I, I'm following at the moment is the different uh, features that uh, could be allowed through the processes. Well, there could be online or offline processes. So just to uh, show you, I want to talk about all the, the, those features, and that's why it's like a, written in very small. I will talk about the, the ones that are written in red, which doesn't appear red to me right now, but it's okay. Um, so the, 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 what is interesting with the platforms is that they could allow uh, citizens to comment uh, those proposals and to vote. Uh, so that, that are the different um, uh, features, the main features that could be interesting. Before uh, uh, understanding that, we need to uh, see the, the, the bigger picture of the budget. 
So most of the cities in France are spending much less than 1% of the local budget, very far from a third of the local budget, like in Seoul. Uh, and sometimes it becomes very uh, ridiculous. So for example, in Puteaux, uh, one of the last processes started last year, they are deciding about something that is just a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, so basically the idea behind this is like, the uh, city officials also try to put like some kittens. Uh, to, uh, they are trying to say, well, it's your taxes, but just let us uh, deal with that. You do not really have a say about the, the, the most of the part of the budget. So if you look at the, the, where the, the platforms, uh, so this is our numbers from uh, uh, 20, uh, well, from last year, so like, as I said, we have like 70 more processes that uh, have been started in the last uh, six months. So this is not like uh, the current uh, trend. But there are a few things that are very interesting. First, there are very few uh, processes that are really using platforms that are allowing um, comments. And the last, the one thing that is in, in interesting as well is like, when a proposal is being uh, analyzed by the city, uh, the city council, then uh, we are witnessing something that is in, interesting to me, is the fact that you don't see when the, 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 some proposals are rejected by the city official for uh, many reasons. There is not any explanation, justification on the website saying why those proposals are being uh, rejected. So if you look at the website, just to explain you, uh, and then I will have some help, yeah, thank you. Uh, so for example, in the, this website from uh, saint -Lys, you just have like, uh, it's not interactive at all. Basically, you could download the rules, you could uh, download like the, uh, the, the, the form, and you have like a, a, sp a specific PDF explaining the rules, but you don't have any kind of, uh, of uh, interactivity, because then the, the form, you will have to send it by email, so it's very, uh, a very simple website, and that doesn't cost a lot of money, of course. Uh, as I said, like most of the cities are very uh, small towns. In this, in this one, for example, it's like uh, uh, they are using uh, uh, um, uh, open source platform to provide like only uh, special forms. So they're not using a Google Forms, they're using an open source platform, but still it's just like a form. There is not any transparency, so basically when you are uh, um, submitting your proposal, you won't see this proposal listed with other uh, proposals. So you won't be allowed to comment that, of course, and to call uh, and to comment the the, uh, the other uh, proposals. Like in this one, so it's like a fifteen uh, thousand euros. It's a, a small pot of money, but it's also a spot a small spot of a uh, small pot of uh, uh, of money because it's a small city. In that case, what I'm trying to do at, at the moment is also trying to um, use social network analysis in order to connect those features with the city uh, cases. So basically, I'm trying to uh, understand a little bit the families, the different variations between, um, uh, between the, the processes and the construction of those families uh, through the years. So basically, in blue, I will just will talk about the, the well, the two, uh, two families. There is one that is related to the cases that appears in green, which are very uh, processes that, where you don't have any, any uh, platform, and you don't have any, okay, you don't have any, um, any discussion at the city level. It's just like mainly uh, at the district level. Uh, well, you have other, uh, other uh, cases uh, that are in blue, in uh, light blue, that were uh, using platforms that could allow uh, transparency and, and comments. What I want to show with this graph is like uh, years after years, actually, most of the processes are not, and Paris is in blue, so basically most of the processes that are growing are in purple and in, in orange, uh, which shows actually they are not following the same rules. Than, uh, than Paris. <coughs> so we got like different digital platforms, uh, providers in France, um, uh, Cap Collective got like many websites, and you have like IDE City, Opportunities Politics is providing uh, the, the, the adaptation of DCD uh, made by uh, uh, Barcelona, and then you have other uh, platforms. So basically, uh, what's one thing that is very interesting, when you look at the rules, um, 
you have some project that could be rejected based on different criteria. Uh, and what could happen, uh, I won't, uh, yeah, what I will try to explain to you is like when it's filtered, there is uh, this review done by the city council. And then at some point, in the best cases, like in Paris, or I believe in most of the, the cases that are done with the uh, DCDIM, uh, you will see the justification of those proposals, why they are rejected before the vote. Then you have something that I called informal evaporation. So basically, the city council will try to merge different proposals based on their own logic, and there is not much uh, accountability on that, and that's very problematic to me. And then there are some proposals that are approved for the voting phase without any modification. But if you look at, uh, for example, Paris yesterday, uh, uh, between, depending on where, how you calculate this, there is between uh, 60 to 80 percent of the proposals that are rejected, which is like a lot of. So it's a, it's not a, a process that is very really, um, uh, like uh, direct democracy. It's like much more a bureaucratic uh, process. So just to conclude, uh, we got a first wave uh, that was like uh, more than 20 years ago now. Uh, that with the, the creation was all, and just like now, it's always top down. So it's like created by city officials. The power sharing at that time, it was like only consultative, now it's decisive. The deliberation is very low. We don't have, I haven't talked much about that, but we have very uh, few uh, public meetings uh, that could help to gather uh, different point of views about the different proposals. And the platforms, are, most of the processes are not using platforms that are. Uh, uh, allowing comments. The scope is also different. Uh, 15 years ago, it was much more about your neighborhood, the, the local area, uh, let's say at the street level. Well, now you could have more and more processes that decide at the city level. Uh, the procedurals are more clear, but still we could see this thing of uh, cherry picking, which is still happening behind the scenes. So it's something that I won't show in details uh, right now, but just as I said, with the example of Paris, like 80% of the proposals are rejected before the vote. So basically, you're just allowing the citizens to decide about a very specific part uh, at the end. And then you give the vote. Uh, the vote is giving like some legitimacy to that. OK, pretty goals. Same car, same map. I won't talk about that. Uh, we just have to uh, think that's PB is not a robust democratic innovation, so we need to take care how to make it better. And I have one minute left to tell you that I see at least three challenges that could be uh, uh, addressed. First, the scope of projects. We need to move from uh, proposals uh, to something that is more um, like strategic planning, because uh, you can't discuss something, for example, I see that in, in, in Madrid, they were able to vote like two years ago about the, the cost of the ticket for the public transport. That is not something that you could address in participatory budgeting in, in France. So maybe we need to think about something that is bigger than just like the, the, the next to the, the around the, the, yeah, the, the corner, the, the processes that, the, the projects that are just next to the, your corner. Then why we need to limit those uh, proposals to infrastructure projects? We need to move beyond only capital uh, budget. We need a bigger pot of money for sure, because so far it's just ridiculous the way that is being spent. Then we need to, okay, uh, to ensure fewer barriers and in the same time to uh, have more deliberation in order to allow empowerment. Uh, at some point, we just don't know what uh, citizens could really learn in public processes. Then at some point, we don't know, also because of the platforms, we don't know uh, why um, uh, they could uh, trust other citizens and also the impact, uh, or you could trust your city council in a better way. We don't have any uh, impact assessment of that. And the last point is that we might see for the next election next year, a higher turnout. I think most of the, the, the processes that were created for the last two years had this in mind, like if we are creating PB, maybe we have a higher turnout uh, and maybe they will vote for the current government. So we will see exactly how PB affects the next local elections results. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.
Oh. Well, first of all, hello. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm very happy to, to be here today with these great speakers in this session and the audience. I have to say also that I'm a bit sad uh, because I didn't put any kitten in our slides. Uh, so sorry for that. But we'll try to bring your attention. So this is the last slide. Uh, it's nice to say thanks at the beginning, but uh, <laughs> if we can go to the first one, please, it could be much easier. Spoiler alert. So thank you very much. I'm today uh, with my colleague Virgil from Open Source Politics, Code for France and Democracy Earth. Uh, but we're going to talk specifically about Decidim, uh, the Municipal Action Plan in Barcelona, and also like Decidim as a platform beyond the Barcelona scope. So first understand this project that has been mentioning, it has been mentioned in the uh, in the last presentations, I have to explain a very particular instance that maybe is um, one of the most representative ones, that is the one of the City Council of Barcelona, where everything started. Uh, so what is the City in Barcelona? Well, the City in Barcelona is a platform. It's the city participatory democratic platform to host multiple processes, uh, government strategic city planning, citizen initiatives, and other kind of participatory processes. Uh, but it's also the largest free open source project of Barcelona City Council and a prototype for public funded uh, participatory digital infrastructure. And most importantly, it's not only a common in terms of the code, but it's also a common in terms of the management. It's co-designed in a participatory manner by a community which is called Meta the City. But we are here in Tic Tech, and Tic Tech is about impact. So let's start to talk a bit about impact, and in terms of quantitative indicators, when we're talking about the impact of the city in Barcelona, we're talking about a platform that has more than 30,000 participants. At this moment, there are 12 participatory processes open. Uh, in total, there have been more than 30. Now there are also like collective account, uh, collective spaces called assemblies. There are more uh, than 100. It's 174 in this moment. There are thousands of uh, proposals, affected proposals, supports, results, debates. So we're talking about big numbers in the scale of the city of Barcelona. And why why did that number happen? Well, mostly because it started with a very important process, which is a municipal action plan. The Municipal uh, Action Plan is uh, uh, the roadmap of the political gov local government of Barcelona, and it has to be co-designed by law in a participatory manner. So in 2016, uh, the city in Barcelona was deployed, and during three months, uh, there were proposals from the city council, the official ones, but there were also proposals from citizens, proposals from orga organization, and also proposals that emerged in offline meetings. So during those three months, uh, citizens, we were invited to co-create proposals, discuss proposals, support the ones we were interested, and in the end there were like more than 40,000 participants, more than 10,000 proposals, more than 100,000 supports. But more impo importantly, uh, there were also like offline meetings to discuss proposals in the platforms and also then to dump those ideas that emerged in the offline meetings to the offline. So it was an hybrid process, like the offline should be facilitated by the online. How can we see that? Well, this is an analysis, a network analysis of the interactions in the platform during that process, so the comments between users, and we can see in the middle there is this big node, which is the city council, that made like the first one th more than 1,000 proposals, the official ones that came from a collaborative process of the ruling party. And there is a community around it, but mostly there is another community in other color, both are red, but... Uh, it's not so visible, maybe yet, I'm not sure. But there is a, a second largest community, which is mostly like the citizens of Barcelona in a distributed way creating and co-creating those proposals. And around you can see some specific community in the periphery, which are civic organizations that they were doing proposals in these offline meetings and also bringing their community. So it was like a complex uh, social structure for doing so in the digital sphere. But as I say, this hybrid participation, so there were more than 400 uh, offline meetings where proposals were discussed and also some proposals were proposed and they went to the platform. And it happened in almost, well, it happened in every district of the city and in different topics of this uh, uh, municipal action plan, which is good government, good living, plural economy, global justice, and ecological transition. 
And this is the result that we got. Like here is more than 10,000 uh, proposals that then they have to be converted into action plans, and those action plans translated into projects. So here we can see like most of the ones that came from the city council were accepted, obviously because they came from a participatory process of the ruling party. And the ones from organizations and the ones from like meetings that were co-created, they were much more successful than the one of individual citizens that most of them they were accepted, but obviously the acceptance rate was a bit lower from this many times individualistic approach, like collaboration and cooperation matters in terms of acceptance of the proposals. And it has been discussed before, like, uh, the, the third step that you comment how to implement. Well, one of the things that the city included almost from the beginning is like most of these civic tech that we have uh, been seeing across years, they are asking us as citizens to participate in co-creation of ideas, brainstorming, debating, and sometimes decision making. But when decisions are made, we cannot track the implementation of those decisions. So from the early beginning, and this is a real-time monitor, you can see in the CDM, like every proposal that you have participated, if this is accepted or not, in which action plan is included, which projects and which indicators see the progress of that proposal, and you can check that in real time. And in this moment, like this uh, municipal action plan is close to a 90% of execution. So it's participation is not only until the phase of decision making. Like participants, we should be invited to participate in accountability and tracking the implementation of, how, of the things that have been decided. So this is the city in Barcelona, and it's work for the city. But of course, uh, from the design team, we had an idea of a much global scope for other cities, but also for organizations. So for doing so, we thought in this roadmap that now we are in the last stage, the first one is the municipal action plan, but then we found that we need to have multiple processes, not only the municipal action plan, but we need some spaces that were more than processes. We need assemblies that maybe it's not a process in terms that it doesn't have a temporal dimension, but it's like a collective space. Also initiatives for bottom-up uh, ideas, consultations for top-down, but also we need uh, maybe multi-organizations, so having like a multi-tenancy model that you can provide services, like the CDM as a service in terms of democracy as a service, and in the end incorporate notifications and uh, activity stream to have a political network. So it's, it's not only participation, it's about political participation. And because we're talking about politics, I think it's quite important to, to say like, to do politics, we need different features. Of course, PB. PB is very important, but we need, and as done in the same voting, we need uh, these results and accountability. We need offline meetings. We need uh, proposals, debates, conferences space, the notifications, the possibility of having uh, participatory text, uh, pages. But how to do so? Well, with free, libre, open source. If it's not open source, seriously, it's not transparent. If it's not transparent, it's not democratic. I seriously believe that this would be out of discussion. Like we were talking about democratic civic tech, it has to be open source. Otherwise, it might be a technology for civic purposes, but it's not going to be democratic. And it's not, if we're talking about democratic, it's not only about the computing code. It's also about the political code. So the CDM does not only include a flaws license, but a social contract. It's not the license of how, uh, how the uh, computing code must be deployed, but also how this code has to be implemented in a political level. So every instance of the CDM that is recognized as an official instance of the CDM, everyone can install it and use it because it's free, it's libre. But if you want to do it in a correct political and democratic way, you have to f fulfill the social contract that express terms of open to, it must be open to collaboration, everything must be transparent, traceable, in, in, uh, integral. There should be the fulfillment of very basic democratic quality guarantees like, hey, human rights? Are we using civic tech for human rights? It should be granted by a social contract. And for sure, to ensure the privacy and security of users, because in the end our participants are citizens. So these are the ideas that we had when we deploy uh, when we start co-designing the CDM in a participatory manner with our own community, which is called Mita the CDM, and now with a governing process uh, that came as to build a, an association to co-design 
the next steps of the CD, but for doing so and to validate all these ideas that uh, we have been presenting from the side of the CD, I thought and we thought that the best way to validate if these ideas were solid or they were possible to make real or not was to consider another agent from the ecosystem to see if it's possible to replicate this model out of the Barcelona, Catalan, or Spanish context, for instance, in the French context. So for that, I'm so happy to have today Virgil Deville that is going to explain how they replicate this model in France and Belgium and other places. Thank you, Pablo. You're very tall. Yeah, that's, that's more my size. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, uh, our job at Open Source Politics uh, has been since 2015 to implement uh, open source civic tech for public institutions. So we've been, we've always been in uh, an approach where we wanted to join an existing project, be a partner, be a, a contributor with technology, with use cases, and we've been using a bunch of platforms. Um, but in 2016, uh, so in 2015, we were kind of building our own thing and like being a very small community and wanted to by and our approach was using like a CMS like Drupal and plug small tools like Democracy S, Ushaidi, and like that was a, a really hard approach uh, in terms of maintenance and, and evolution. But we had like similar ideas when we were working on our CMS as uh, the CDIM was, was working. We had the same ontology with participatory spaces, uh, the, the little tools that we were installing were like meant as features. And when we stumbled upon, uh, upon Decidim, we saw that there was something go going on that was way bigger than what we were trying to do. And uh, it's why we joined Decidim, that we were alone in our little ecosystem trying to collaborate with a lot of small civic tech projects. And we saw Decidim coming, and it was huge. I mean, uh, Decidim, Pablo was talking about it, it's way more than just uh, a, uh, an open source project. It's a whole ecosystem behind it. Over 100 people are working on it, uh, are employed, are living out of the CDIM. And the ecosystem is more or less composed by four, uh, I'd say, circles. The, the, and it's very interesting that they are very interdisciplinary. There is a research group around the CDIM uh, with a few universities uh, in Catalonia, but also in France now. We have a, uh, a researcher that's working with us at the ENS. Uh, there is a, a whole lab dedicated to it in Barcelona in, that's very open and everyone can come into and like produce knowledge and experiences around uh, the city. It's a huge, beautiful brick building in, in Barcelona and there's lots of events, like the last one was about the impact of like uh, gender when you're building technology and the divide of like being many men working on, 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 uh, on, on technology and how it impacts the software. So, they are leading like uh, very uh, deep uh, reflections on like what we are doing uh, as, a, as a whole ecosystem, not just the software. It's, it's interesting also that uh, the, city, the, the city of Barcelona had an approach of like not trying to code its own thing with public servant, but like trying to make a big project from the beginning with many contributors. And like from the start, they got uh, a little consortium of uh, SMEs like us, uh, and in Barcelona, which are like uh, small businesses, uh, technical uh, development teams, design uh, consultancy. And from the start, there were like 20, 30 uh, contributors to the project with uh, businesses that could actually provide services around uh, the platform, which is very important for its maintenance over the course of the future, because you can't rely on public funds all, uh, all your, all, for all the project life. And the last part is very interesting because, uh, as Paolo was saying, it's uh, more than an open source project, it's a, it's a public common. So institutions are partnering with the project because they are using it and uh, they rely on it and there are more and more uh, institutional partners that are investing in a mutual common and uh, uh, joining forces uh, to build around the CDM as, as it's becoming uh, an, import, an important part of their participatory infrastructure. Um, so what you, Pablo went quite quick on what is actually Decidim, but what, why we were interested by it is that uh, it's, a, it's a project that was meant to kind of spread outside of, uh, the, of Barcelona and Catalonia, and uh, in that manner the ontology and the architecture uh, was the thing that really interested in, uh, us, because we needed 
as we are working with many institutions from the small city council of 10,000 people to uh, the, a, a big region uh, or even the National Assembly some, uh, sometimes, we need something that's very flexible and that can adapt to the context. And that's the very ar architecture of the city. So you have uh, participatory spaces, and then, like uh, almost Lego, you're building out your whole process using uh, bricks of features that will help you map your process with information and uh, interactive participation. So that's what's really interesting about the Sims, that you can mostly do whatever you want if you have a little creativity. We've never been blocked uh, by the Sidim, and we, were, we could always find you know, a way aside or a way of con configuring uh, the, the project. So that, that was a big attraction for us, and that's why today uh, businesses are able to provide a service. They, they don't have to revamp the whole software to actually use it uh, in a different country, in a different context. Um, the drawback of that architecture is that uh, Decidim has grown to be a massive piece of software because Barcelona was very ambitious with their roadmap of doing consultation, uh, then uh, multi-consultancy, then multi-tenant, then uh, political social network. And uh, the problem is that uh, flexibility equals to complexity. Today we have a, a, a very elegant and very uh, powerful piece of software, but there is a lot to understand for the admins, the public servant that are using it, and that's, that's something we can manage through formation. But even for the users, like when you come to the city in Barcelona, you have 30 processes, thousands and thousands of proposals. We, we have a big task ahead of uh, using innovative technology to have people navigate into such a massive flow of participation using, I don't know, AI or even mobile technology or asking interests so we can direct people towards the, the information that are, they are mostly interested about. Um, so what's interesting about this name, as I was saying, is that uh, it's, uh, for me, it's uh, public funded free software done uh, in the most efficient way. You have a very low buzz factor because they got a lot of uh, different people to contribute uh, from the very beginning. Today there are 53 people um, working on, on, the, on the project. So we have a low buzz factor, meaning like the project, even if Barcelona is not uh, there in the future, the project is not going anywhere because many people are working on it. There is like high, very, very high quality and on the, on the code. So it's a very stable piece of technology. And the modular structure makes it that we have a core, uh, a core technology and then people can build module and we are all bringing the effort to one repo and which, make, which makes it uh, quite, quite stable and evolutive. Um, the installation is quite easy and the multi-tenancy mode allows for like uh, widespread distribution. The, pro the project is not that old and there are many, many organizations using it. Um, there is uh, governance around the common, so m m often in open source projects you don't have a very formalized governance there. You, you can join, it's open, and it's like there is a process to accept new features, anyone can participate, and that's very impressive because you can actually like know what you're putting uh, yourself into and know that you can have an impact. It's not just the guys in Barcelona who are deciding. And uh, the, the good thing is that um, it's, uh, it's very interdisciplinary. I was telling about the ecosystem. We have specialists in physical participation, we have researchers, we have designers, we have public agents, we have coders. So there is like, Decidim is very much the produce of that. Um, today, Decidim has been quite successful in extending its model uh, out of Barcelona, out of Catalonia. We are, there are like more than 100 organizations using it. In France and Belgium, we are responsible for 30 installations. And it's interesting to see that the ontology is now working for uh, other kind of uh, use case, like cooperatives, uh, collective, uh, for, for governance uh, generally. I put myself the, the timer, I don't know why. But basically the, 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 the word I wanted to finish with is we're talking a lot about civic tech, but when, when we got really deep with open source politics inside the Decidim community, and uh, actually we found out that many of the people building this technology are kind of uh, 15M uh, veterans, and they are they they go way beyond what civic take is. They are like what they are building is technopolitics is, and the definition Pablo gave me yesterday is that it's uh, yeah uh, technopolitics is tactical and strategic and critical use of uh, digital technology for collective political participation, and it's uh, it's very much uh, Decidim is very much the re the result of that thinking 
meaning that the, the fact that they not, did not only build uh, open source software, they built the whole uh, ecosystem, they uh, had a social contract, uh, they uh, did the link between uh, offline participation, online participation, they went through the whole process of like having people to participate and having people tracking the, the implementation. So that it, this is technopolitics, it's like how do we, earn, do we govern with the multitude because today it's, in the, it's, it's inevitable and it's the, the, very, the, the things that they learn in 50M and like they were working with many software at the same time, Twitter, Facebook, uh, online streaming, pads, Decidim is kind of the result of like all the research, all the knowledge that was built out as activism. And it's interesting because it's, uh, it's, Decidim is the emanation of technopolitics, but from the institution for citizens. So that was the final word, technopolitics. I hope you guys pick it up uh, because for, for now, it's, uh, we were discovering it and we hope like uh, if you have some questions, please, uh, please do. Thanks. Yes, can I gather the other speakers on the stage for the Q&A? So, yes, just a quick word on the schedule changes this morning. So we'll have a 10 minute Q&A now, we'll then go straight into the next session, and then there'll be a break between that session and the keynote. So after the session, go straight on to the next one. Okay, there's some remarks at the back. Uh, so can we keep questions you know, relatively short? I'll take them in groups for free. And any hands up for questions? Any other questions in the room to do in the group, or we can do it one by one? Cool. Right. Yes, please. Um, many thanks to the panel. Um, thank you, Panthea, for your presentation. My name is Amina Saluhu. I work with the MacArthur Foundation in Abuja. And I wanted to ask if you have kind of looked at the intersection between participation and power, and the fact that maybe sometimes citizens at least in my part of the world, my thing that power does not reside with the citizen at a point where you decide what goes in the budget, because the budget hardly ever gets implemented. The best you get is 35 to 50 percent. Where power would reside is if you are able to get an impact. The particular project that you thought you wanted to have in that budget gets passed. Are we thinking of possibility of having? Um, civic tech tools that allow citizens track implementation. This, I think, might be a way um, to get citizens getting more excited because right now there's a very low expectation of government, which is a very sad place to be. And I'd also like to hear a bit, as you talk about technopolitics, about how that connects with voice and women's participation, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, behind you. Hi, thank you, that was fascinating, and I'm sorry I missed the first one. Uh, quick question, the one is, there's a big qualitative difference between the picture of France, painted in the second presentation, and the picture of Spain and emerging France and Belgium. And since uh, you talked about the context drivers that allow policy transfers, it would be great to hear a bit from any of you, what do you think it is that enabled that different implementation of participatory processes and a different social contract that wasn't, has not been there in France the past 10 years and didn't allow this to happen, maybe? Just you. And the second, if, if you have any time, like the monitoring part, the tracking the projects, like I can name so many big institutions and corporations struggling with their project management offices, trying to, uh, to figure out how to keep track of projects. So how does this actually work? Like who says the project is on track? What kind of updates are there? That could be great. Cool, thanks. Uh, yes, let's go with those. Uh, should, uh, do these mics work at the moment? Yes. Fantastic, cool. So if you just want to sort of take it in turn, should have a go at those questions, we've got about five, six minutes. So keep answer short, but hopefully involved. Thank you. Okay, regarding, uh, well, those were very good questions. Uh, the first one, uh, regarding the, the power relationship, I, I, I really agree mm -hmm. on that. Like, I think the purpose of uh, developing uh, this kind of technology that we have been presenting is not having technology just for the civic purpose. Uh, this, is, this is very needed. 
but we need to rethink the power relationships. And this is something that we have been wondering around the deciding project in terms like if the, a very specific group that are policy makers and software developers are deciding uh, the design of this kind of technologies and they are deciding at an ontology of what participation is, how participation must be, and more interestingly, what is not included in their participatory model instead of the institution. So that's why of one of the reasons why Decidim, uh, we use as a community our own instance, it is called like eat your own dog food, because if it doesn't work for us, it cannot work for their cities or organization, and using that instance for taking decision as a community, because as a community, and the community that is started in Barcelona, but now it's getting international, to redesign how is the digital uh, um, reflection of the power relationships. Otherwise, uh, those technologies will be always be designed and developed by very specific group that normally are the privileged ones and they have like very strong bias in terms of age, status, gender, and so on. And it's very important what you say about gender. Like for instance, we have research seminars every, every month in the meta uh, community. And the last one, it was last, uh, last Tuesday, Tuesday last week, sorry. And it was about the city and feminists, like trying to understand how would be the CDM if we would have uh, applied a gender perspective uh, from the beginning. So we like, in this research seminar usually, and it happened like three researchers, three women in this case, they came, they explained their views about feminism technology, and we review all the existing layers of contribution to the project, review the code norms, the gender gap, and try to find the most critical ones. For instance, the most critical one is code de development. Uh, it's hard to, uh, yet find women who can contribute uh, to that. So try to find uh, strategies to mitigate that gap, like for instance, like uh, giving training on the language that this program is in, which is Ruby on Rails, and trying to think in academies or summer school that they can uh, especially focus to women so we can uh, incorporate uh, a more diverse perspective. Uh, gender is one of the dimensions, but there are so many. And uh, there was the other question there. One it was about the difference between the French ecosystem. I think you can explain that better. But there was another, ah, the traceability, accountability. Yeah, I think this is very important. But in terms of like accountability, uh, must be I think it must be developed and deployed in a way that it facilitates the work of public officers. If it's the nightmare of public officers, it won't be sustainable in the long term. So the idea is like uh, in this case, in the instance of Barcelona, the public officers of Barcelona they can upload using the. Uh, the data of the projects that they are tracking, they can upload it in a uh, open data format directly to the instant of the CDM. So that's how the uh, institution can that get updated. And of course, as I say, in a way of facilitation. So when someone is interested in knowing the current status of the project, uh, that helps us to, to them to express how they are working. And in the end, it's a way to facilitate the communication of the existing work of the City Council of Barcelona. And regarding the other question, I think Brigil can explain so much better than me. If uh, I don't know if you if you guys wanna, but I can just about like the the difference that we observe, observed from the Spanish context to the French context. Uh, I think um, Gilles did a, quite a good work uh, presenting uh, some of the some of a lot of information about that, and uh, it's true. Uh, we are doing a lot of PBs on the CDM when in. Spain Pain. Uh, it's a feature that's been there, but hasn't, hasn't been much developed because they didn't really find a use case. So they had uh, the city in Barcelona for four years, but they, they didn't do a participatory budgeting. So that's one of the big difference where like, there is this growth and we are seeing it, like we have seven uh, institutions working with the city on participatory budgeting. And also um, we see that in France, we have more uh, tradition, when we go out of uh, participatory budgeting, we tend to be way less uh, binded with the result of consultation. So we will just crowdsource uh, ideas, proposal, comments, and make a synthesis, and uh, not use the rest of the platform. Whereas in, uh, in Spain, as they have like uh, an, active in scene, an activist scene that I think has been uh, more diverse, more numerous, and also a little bit uh, more engaged and, and, uh, and more demanding uh, from the government at the local level, 
uh, it's uh, they have uh, it's very much designed uh, around accountability. So I put out a proposal, and there must be a response from uh, the public institution uh, to ensure that uh, the participation is listened, heard, and and, and accounted for. Uh, in France, we we are like we have a very good use case with the system with PB, and it's uh, we are like trying to educate and get public institution going uh, further uh, in terms of uh, the the link that they can create with the citizens. But it's a bit hard. It's uh, it's there is a lot of education to be made there. Cool. Um, really quickly on the sort of citizen power question, I think that um, you know I think it's. I mean, what, what, what I was talking about in the presentation is I do think PB, when done well, can do a really great job of, of civic education and helping citizens understand how to engage. Even if they feel like there's no role for them, they don't have power, they are disillusioned. Um, one woman we met in uh, Mexico City, she, had, uh, she was sort of very much of this mindset and uh, through the PB process, uh, basically recovered an abandoned green lot um, in her, uh, in, or uh, an abandoned lot in her neighborhood ended up turning that into um, some kind of sort of park space, submitted several uh, successful proposals over the course of several years, and went on to found an NGO um, that worked with government for urban regeneration. Someone that was totally disengaged, that basically sort of PB hooked them, taught them how to work with the institutions of power and get things done. On the flip side, we've also seen um, scenarios where PB can make citizens uh, further disillusioned, disengaged, whatnot. I think one of the saddest examples that we saw was um, we were in a pretty rural um, village where uh, very poor and, um, and uh, citizens had participated over the course of a year to select uh, 24 different projects that they were very excited about, spent a lot of time deliberating what they cared about, what was most important, all these. Ended up finding out because this was communicated too late to them, there was only $5,000 to implement the projects. So then they ended, ending, ended up implementing three projects um, two classrooms and a bridge. Um, the citizens were then asked to contribute extra money in the form of taxes, um, to contribute labor to actually build these, um, or to contribute in-kind donations in the forms of bricks, concrete, or whatnot, because there weren't enough resources and we wanted to show that there's skin in the game, that they're civically engaged. Um, the bridge, uh, the, one of the classrooms took three years to build. The bridge collapsed um, within a year um, and it was volunteer labor, donated resources, uh, poor quality. And I think that can actually further, of course, disenchant citizens and also sort of contribute to the notion that we are subjects of the state. We will take whatever it is that they give to us and anything else we actually have to do, we have to further contribute ourselves. So I think there's, there's sort of two sides to that and I think it comes down to the process. Um, just on the point on how we track projects. Sorry. Uh, just, uh, I think we've got to start the next session now. So uh, thank you to all our speakers. Okay, you can have 30 seconds if that's okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, we, we could discuss about the drivers and uh, I'm sorry, the, co the coffee time. break. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, so thank you to all our speakers. The next session in here is about corruption and tech. So thanks a lot.